Bravo <rire> Yes, hi, good evening and welcome to our very first YouTube live lecture hosted by Die Neue Sammlung, the Design Museum. Um, my name is Caroline Fuchs and I'm a curator here at the museum. Um, first, I'm very sorry for the delay and uh, thank you all for staying with us. Um, I hope we will all enjoy tonight's program very much. Um, this talk is part of the Connection series and supported by UI. So first, the present situation sometimes calls for unusual settings, so you should know that I'm speaking to you from my home. <laughs> and Asif Khan will also speak from his home. We're not at Pinacothek de Moderne. And on this note, I want to give a huge thanks to everyone behind the scenes who made this possible, also on short notice. So tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Asif Khan from London, who will be joining us very shortly. But before we bring him into the talk, I would like to introduce him to you. So our guest tonight is the founder of the London-based architecture studio Asif Khan Limited. Um, since its foundation in 2007, he has worked on a large variety of international projects, ranging from exhibition and cultural buildings to installation and landscapes. Um, he has won several prestigious awards, among them the Cannes Lion Grand Prix for Innovation Award for his Mega Faces installation, several awards for his We Are Energy Pavilion um, that represented the UK at the Astana Expo in 2017. And the same year, he also received an MBE, a Most Excellent Order of the British Empire for Services to Architecture. Now, his most recent work, which you may have seen in the press, uh, includes the entry portals to the Dubai Expo 2020 that pioneer a new use of carbon fiber by creating an enormous structure that is at the same time incredibly thin and incredibly light. So last year, Die Neue Sammlung, our museum was extremely lucky to have an exhibition designed by him. Um, it was titled A Different Perspective, African Ceramics from the Collection of Franz, Duke of Bavaria. It opened last year in September and closed amidst the lockdown in April this year. Thanks Thanks to Asif's Khan design, we were able to show this very unique collection in a very unique setting, 
that provided different spaces for the exhibition and made it possible to view the objects from very different perspectives. Um, so I'm very curious what new perspectives on space and architecture he will show us tonight. But before I hand over to Asif, here's an important notice to the audience. Um, we invite you to type in questions during the talk into the YouTube chat. Um, we will collect these, these questions during the talk and I will pose as many of them as we have time for after Asif's presentation. And now I'm very pleased to invite Asif to join us online. Welcome, Asif. Hi, Caroline, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you, Asif? Very good to yeah, see you. So, uh, yes, great. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it's very, I'm very glad that we can do this, even though we cannot do it in person. Um, yes, so I'm very curious about your great exhibition talk. Um, so please. <laughs> okay, I'll, ta I'll take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. So uh, thanks everyone uh, for joining uh, this evening. And um, I think we have about an hour and the final, uh, I think 15 minutes of that or something is for like discussion and questions. So I hope you uh, can, can save up some thoughts so we can have a bit of uh, interaction. Um, I'm really open uh, to hear uh, your perspectives. Uh, it's, a, it's obviously a, it's a time when all of us have been doing thinking, sitting at home. Uh, maybe some of us have been unfortunate enough or we have members of our family who've, who've caught COVID and had to uh, really suffer and, and so on. And, Others of us who have been on the sidelines watching all that happen have spent a lot of time digesting and, and kind of uh, trying to make sense of where the world is now. And so with this talk, I thought I would do a little bit of a, uh, some thinking about that, but within the context of exhibition design and within the context of uh, leading to the work that we did uh, with Caroline and her team, on this exhibition of African ceramics at the uh, New Samlon. Um, so uh, I think all of us have felt um, that the internet um, has been both a great friend and a great uh, enemy during this time, during the last you know, four or five months. And uh, whilst it's provided um, a lot of, uh, let's say, um, diversion and uh, and maybe it started to achieve uh, its its sort of um, a potential as kind of this repository of of all knowledge, all possible information, all possible conversations that can happen at once, uh, like the ultimate, the greatest exhibition that could, there could ever be. Um, I think at the same time, it's um, it's proved a great distraction. And uh, all of the kind of amazing thoughts that we could have been having during the last few months uh, sometimes end up in places where we don't expect. And this, this kind of idea of the rabbit hole and uh, uh, depending on this medium, which is meant to lead us somewhere, somewhere really wonderful, you know, from objects from around the world. But in the end, we might discover we're just looking at pizza. This is like the experience of, of for me every day. That I'm having, uh, and I think it's a little bit like this tower of uh, the Library of Babel, which uh, Borges imagined, um, which was, in a way, an infinite space, uh, books, an infinite number of books in an infinite library, and the idea that all knowledge is in there somewhere, everything we could ever imagine, is in these hexagonal rooms which run in infinitely in X and Y directions, but also up and down. And uh, at the same time as being a kind of utopia and the kind of repository of all knowledge possible, it's also a kind of hell. And I think we find ourselves a little bit in that place as unguided uh, explorers, constantly seeking knowledge and encountering knowledge, but never being able to turn that knowledge into wisdom. And that is something that, uh, I hope, and I kind of want to make the, 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 the argument for, is the value, the great value of exhibition design and curation uh, in this infinite, uh, infinite territory of, of the digital world, which we're, which we're kind of on the cusp of and we're experiencing at the moment, that we need to edit and um, turn 
information into stories and into things that everyday people can understand. And that's the job of the exhibition designer and our job of the curator. So uh, working together. Uh, let's remind ourselves of uh, the first museum. And this is, uh, if I take you back 500 years before the birth of Christ, we're in uh, modern day Iraq, but this was uh, uh, um, Neo-Babylon at the time. And the daughter of the then uh, uh, emperor of the civilization, uh, Enigal Didnani, she put together um, an exhibition in what is thought of as uh, the first museum uh, in the world. And at least we know that because items have been discovered from there, uh, which were items which related to over two, across about 2,000 years of history, but they were all found in one room. And it was assumed by the archaeologists at the time, I think in the 20s when they first discovered it, that these were, um, uh, let's say, the first exhibition. And what was inside that exhibition was an attempt by uh, Enigaldi Nani to, to curate an experience um, to tell a story about um, the previous dynasties, which their dynasty was a continuation of. So it was a, it was a narrative. And all that was left of that museum uh, was this clay, clay uh, uh, series of cylinders, which are thought of as the world's first museum labels. And what these uh, cuneiform uh, cylinders showed that there were a variety of visitors to this exhibition. It was, it was in a number of different dialects, which meant that they would receive guests who would look at these objects and understand the narrative that they were trying to express about themselves and where their dynasty uh, was in, this, in the kind of uh, um, story of time and perhaps give a suggestion of where it was going in the future. Now, if we sort of fast forward to uh, what's called the Great Exhibition of 1851. Uh, this is a kind of another, I think, big important landmark in time. Uh, you hear, see here a, a napkin sketch of uh, a piece of architecture, but the piece of architecture was essentially the, not just a container for the exhibition, but uh, in, in my opinion, it was the exhibition itself. And um, the, the, the the Great Exhibition of 1851 was um, was conceived by the then uh, Prince Albert, who was the uh, the wife of Queen, the husband of Queen Victoria, and um, he, uh, a German, as you, yeah, uh, he came with very new ideas to um, um, let's say radically uh, recharge the this moment at the end of the Industrial Revolution and to create an exhibition that was unmatched anywhere in the world. The image you're seeing is of Joseph Paxton, who was his architect. And he was a gentleman who uh, was a garden designer originally, and then a guy who made garden structures. He wasn't even a real engineer. He made uh, conservatory structures for, um, for some of the great houses in history. Um, they had about 100 entries to their competition for, this, for a building for this great exhibition, you know, an exhibition of all of the riches of the, the British Empire, all of the wonderful uh, um, objects and carpets and lion's heads and you know, everything you can imagine, the cornucopia, to show the greatness of the empire. Um, but every design they came up, up with wasn't able to reach the budget and the kind of time requirements they had. Um, what Paxton did is he combined his knowledge of engineering of garden structures, uh, these, the great lily house he made at Chatsworth, for example, and um, what was possible in the world of um, iron, uh, construction with iron and glass. And he conceived of an architecture which was um, modular, uh, mass produced and scalable. And he was able to make a building that was uh, at the time, the largest building in the world. Uh, the building was so large, this is in Hyde Park in, in London, that it actually encompassed uh, around 10 elm trees, which were on the site itself. Now, so, like for us now, this seems sort of uh, like normal, right? But no one had ever firstly created a, uh, a form of architecture which had such rapid construction and durability. Um, 
And they had never conceived of um, the idea of the inside and the outside being blended together. The idea of greenery on the inside of a building like um, that you were using completely conventionally was, was unheard of. Um, but he also conceived of the wall of a building as glass. It's something we take for, for granted today. Um, but if you think about every glass and steel building you see everywhere in the world, it is uh, this building in 1851 was a blueprint for that. We would be in a very, very different place in our cities if this building hadn't been designed and hadn't been conceived of for the great ex exhibition. So um, my kind of thought is that, that this building itself is the exhibition itself. Even though the things inside uh, the exhibition, you know, locomotives and, you know, bizarre bizarre uh, objects like this, maybe the very first Alexa, I don't know. Um, but the, the, the building itself was the greatest um, manifesto for what the industrial revolution could produce. And every message that, uh, that Albert wanted to t tell the world at uh, the Great Exhibition was told by that building. So the building was part of the exhibition. Um, and if we fast forward to Expo 1970, which was uh, held in Osaka in Japan, this is the, the kind of master plan, the blueprint. Uh, a similar thing happened where uh, rather than the structures of the exhibition being the uh, thought of as an independent architecture, they became expressive themselves of that moment in time. And they, they kind of... Um, not only told the story of, of where we were, but also what the future would hold for us. So you see here uh, one of the large structures at the center of the, of the um, expo, which is above us, this enormous uh, super frame structure, which itself has modular buildings installed in it. Um, uh, if you look underneath that, there was a great plaza um, and uh, a place where performance could happen in a kind of liberal free way. It's kind of new ideas of public space usage. Um, the famous Nagakin um, 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 capsule hotel uh, was uh, featured there. You have kind of these early structures. These are things that we're probably not ready to build now, but even in you know, 20, 30 years, we can imagine Elon Musk uh, building this stuff. It's, st it's starting to become uh, possible. This is modular, modular architecture. It's really the future. Um, and here you have some robotic structures, which were done by Arata Isazaki, um, some of the great architects of the time, Kishikurukar, Isazaki, Kenzo Tange, they were all involved in this, and they went on to form this movement called Metabolism, uh, which was at its beginning point uh, in those days, and then went on to become like probably the most important um, post-war architectural movement in, in Japan. Um, so that is the exhibition design, again, just like... Uh, uh, um, just like at our um, uh, 1851 Great Expedi Expedi Exhibition, the architecture uh, and the exhibition design were one thing, and they uh, reinforced uh, the manifesto of the of the exhibition, and uh, the and they led the path very much to the future. Okay, so this is Tange's uh, um, big project in uh, in Tokyo Bay, which was inspired by. Uh, all of that movement going on at the same time. Now I'm going to go forward another 50 years from 1970. This is, a, this is in now 2020. This is, this is this year. And this is the master plan of the Dubai Expo. And this is a, uh, so finally after being a fan of the Great Exhibition, and, and actually I grew up in South London in an area uh, just next to Crystal Palace, which is the name for the, for the, the hall that Joseph Paxton made in 1851. Um, all the streets, the pub on my street is called the Crystal Palace Tavern, in fact. So I grew up around this, and as a kid I was taken there. I never would imagine that I would get to design uh, elements of this, uh, of this uh, master plan, but we were invited to do the entire public realm uh, design of this. So all of the streets and the arrival sequence and anything that's not a, a kind of a pavilion, uh, this was our job, to create the... To create the uh, the infrastructure, but if in our mind, it shouldn't just be infrastructure, it should be exhibition design itself. It should be, um, the task is to kind of curate the narrative for the expo. And this expo is about sort of 
in my mind was about two things, communicating uh, the history and heritage of the region, the Middle East, uh, and let's say the Arab, Arab and Islamic world region with pride to the world, because there's going to be 22 million visitors, and at the same time to communicate the potential of the future. So uh, with our entrances that we created, and this is one of them that Caroline mentioned in the introduction, we, we worked with the, uh, the most kind of advanced uh, carbon fiber engineering, which actually we worked with a, a fantastic company in, in Bavaria, uh, which uh, was, was a fantastic global collaboration of like the best engineers and, and material scientists. And, uh, so this is, um, this is in collaboration with them. And, um, and we created the structure, which was uh, kind of combining uh, like the future of construction with Islamic geometry, uh, with uh, algebra, with mathematics. Um, so it looks to the past and it looks to the future. And the idea is that every person who enters uh, these doors, these great doors, I mean, they're 21 meters high um, at Expo, would understand uh, not just that uh, um, it's a landmark and it's fantastic, you can go through this thing, but they feel the subtle feeling of temperature change from the shading because it acts as a mashrabiya, which is an Arabic screen. They also were in closer inspection. They find it's made out of material which they don't even understand. Uh, and, and it's using an amount of material that is so minimal that they can't comprehend it. Uh, so all of this collection of things, um, it, it's an experience which is spatial and immersive, but it is explaining the, the, the primary curatorial concept of the expo, uh, which is about um, the past and the future kind of meeting together and forming uh, inspiration for the next generation. So we also took that idea through the whole of the public realm with all the streets and the lighting and um, um, uh, the vegetation that we designed, the landscaping and so on. So the whole experience of moving around there is an exhibition without you even realizing it, um, that you understand something about the region, something about um, how it's changing and what it can offer the future uh, with just moving around through it. So this is this was a, um, uh, a kind of contribution of ours to this uh, long history of, of world expos that we hope kind of... Uh, um, was a like a conversation with 1851 and with 1970 Osaka, but in a way that's uh, specific to the region and a way that only the region could do, uh, which is which is very interesting. When you look at the map of uh, world expos, you discover that there's never been any in the Middle East, North Africa, uh, even in Central Asia, which I'll show you later. It was only in 2017 that that one appeared. Okay, so I'm going to move uh, um, forward to another project. Um, and this is, this is another interesting example of uh, thinking about the relationship between architecture and exhibition design. This is in London. Uh, this building you're seeing here is the uh, Smithfield uh, Meat Market, which is uh, in London, if you know uh, the area of Farringdon, it's a major, it has been a major landmark in Farringdon for the past uh, thousand years, in fact, is where London's uh, meat market has sort of always been, Charles Dickens wrote about it and he called it like, a, it's a filthy place. He talked about it as a, um, a place of filth and blood and fat and foam. So it's, you know, it's a stinking, very masculine, very aggressive place. But in, in the 18, uh, 1880s, there was an act to kind of remove all of the, a government act to remove all of the kind of messiness and to house it in these buildings. So what kind of the city architect at the time, Horace Jones created these buildings to house a kind of cleaner market. But uh, since 19, uh, the, the 1990s, um, they, I'd say they've been in decline and a number of the buildings have been derelict, um, you know, now for like 25 years or something. So uh, the Museum of London, uh, uh, a number of years ago, was starting to run out of space. It has 7 million objects in its um in its collection, uh, coll you know, all sorts of things, uh, ephemera and uh, um, kind of from architectural elements of buildings to sort of daily things from people's lives. Um, and it was running out of space and the idea of making a, a, a new museum on the site of this uh, historic market came up. So to convert a market building into a museum, that's a kind of really 
complex idea because um, a, a market isn't a museum uh, and the transformation of that sort is, is quite challenging. Um, uh, so how you, uh, this is a kind of quote from Sharon Ammond, who's the amazing uh, director of the, the current Museum of London. Uh, but she thought of this building as a, um, as a sort of urban think tank. They wanted it to kind of become a, a kind of activist in London's present and London's future. Uh, so this is a kind of a view of it from above. Uh, it's, it's comprised of three buildings and an enormous basement uh, with a train line which runs straight through it. Um, so our approach was to uh, to not treat the building as a uh, as a um, as a piece of architecture. It was to treat the building as um, um, the largest object in the collection. Okay, so it was the largest object in the museum. Maybe item seven million and one. Uh, and we wanted to use the market building to um, create content for the museum in a new way. So externally, in this kind of market houses, we suggested that they could curate um, external partners to come in and to allow the urban block to function as a kind of um, a, a content creator. So by inviting partners such as, you know, our speculation was like the Royal College of Art, you could invite the Victorian Society, you could invite uh, heritage associations, but also like... Why not invite Google or DeepMind AI or something? So you create a kind of cluster, an incubator for new ideas, and the museum becomes a, cr a creator of ideas. Um, and internally, uh, our job, or let's, let's kind of um, say, has been to curate the old market building, whereas externally we're, we're trying to enable content creation. So these are, these are just early sketches about what could happen there. Um, and working with the existing building, we imagined that um, tenants who are partner organizations over time could change their facade. So the, so the museum uh, is a museum which is constantly in flux. So this kind of idea of the museum as a living exhibition of the city, uh, changing ideas, uh, uh, movements, um, I, you know, um, even physical objects, uh, places to go and reflect and to see and debate, um, this is what we wanted the outside of the museum to kind of explore over time. We don't know what that will be uh, because we don't know what uh, um, which partners will eventually be involved and which will change uh, year by year. Um, uh, so uh, whilst that's happening on the outside, internally we're kind of, um, let's say, curating this enormous exhibit, which is the building, and uh, making openings, uh, installing kind of new ways of exhibiting, trying to kind of... Uh, make bold moves in some places and in other places really be respectful of the existing architecture. Um, so, you know, by retention of significant portions of the building fabric, we create a kind of layered, uh, layered view of history. So you get the, the present and then you get the backdrop of history and different layers behind it. We're slowly kind of peeling back uh, the onion skin in a way, um, allowing multiple views, multiple perspectives on this building and on, um, on the present. And we had this idea that uh, anything can happen in, this, in these spaces inside. So by using exhibition design, uh, they can tell the story of London, and they can invite people to kind of become engaged and kind of uh, part of the audience become part of the exhibit in a way. So we don't know how they'll do that, but we're equipping the building to allow them to allow it to be used uh, not only as, as a voice in itself, but um, but the audience as well to get involved and. Uh, inhabit that space. Um, I'm going to take you now to uh, to a project in in Korea. And this is um, a building for for Hyundai. So, whereas the previous one was an example of like an existing piece of architecture, this was a a new piece of architecture acting itself as a as a piece of exhibition design. And here, Hyundai wanted to express the idea of um, of hydrogen. So, this is the the gas which they think will. Uh, Power, or well, let's say, will be the alternative to um, to kind of electrical um, powered cars. They'd like to do a hydrogen powered car. So they asked us to to kind of find a way to introduce the public to hydrogen in a way that um, in a way that they hadn't seen before. Um, you know, if you um, if you imagine. Uh, a lot of research has gone into this hydrogen topic for, 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 for Hyundai. Their scientists have been working on it for many years, the PhDs, 
like really, really researching this, developing these engines and um, hydrogen fuel cells. Um, and uh, the same goes on in museums where like a topic is researched for many years. Someone might spend their whole life invested in a particular topic. And, and sometimes they're so invested in something, they don't really know anymore how to communicate it anymore because their knowledge is super, super, super specialized. And they, you know, if they were asked to explain it to their mom or their kids, it would be impossible. Um, and I sometimes think it's a bit similar to um, uh, the relationship between like writers and, um, and script writers and filmmakers that, you know, you can have a thousand page novel, which might take you, you know, five days or, or uh, two, two weeks to read. Um, and it's a very, very long experience. But um, the challenge of the filmmaker is to transform uh, that very, very long form piece of information into something which can work with a person's attention, which is more like two hours or one and a half hours. Um, and often the role of the exhibition designer um, uh, working with the curator and the researchers kind of who have their PhDs and so on and their doctorates is to help them transform their knowledge, which is super specialized knowledge into something which uh, a, a member of the public can grasp in like 10 minutes. Um, and so sometimes we edit, sometimes we simplify things. Um, and the goal is to, to create this sort of um, really um, to turn the, uh, this information into something that can become like a story, something that can really, um, people can grasp and then tell other people about. So hydrogen, the topic of hydrogen is a huge topic, but we said, well, let's just show people the night sky. And if they understand how beautiful the night sky is and that all those stars in the night sky are floating spheres of hydrogen, they're individual hydrogen fuel scales, they'll understand the enormity and the beauty. So we, we painted this building with a nano coating called Vanta Black. So it became the blackest building on earth, in fact. Um, and uh, going around this building by day, you saw a star field. You saw a building which uh, appeared to be just a field of stars which moved in three dimensions as you walked around it because they're all um, individually mapped to their correct kind of depth and brightness. We, we used information from the European Space Agency, the, the Gaia mission where they, they mapped stars, star directions and, and, and brightness. Um, and so from the outside, people just felt in the daytime they were looking at uh, outer space. And in fact, the, the location of the stars was accurate to if we had cut a hole in the sky and what you people were looking at us in space in that direction. Um, and then actually we put a twist on it. We didn't, we didn't use the exact star locations that they would, they would be at this time. We mapped them to 2000 years in the future, uh, because 2000 years, uh, um, is a sort of 2000 years ago was the creation of the approximately was a creation of the kind of, uh, the Korean nation in mythologically. And so we thought of imagined what would be 2000 years in the future. It's like a kind of palindrome of, uh, of astronomy. Uh, so people experience that on the outside, this kind of one vision of hydrogen. And on the inside, they experienced uh, another vision of hydrogen, which is hydrogen is water. So from black to white uh, internally, and we created this surface, uh, which looks like a kind of city, uh, like viewed from above. And uh, on this surface, uh, tiny droplets of water, 20,000 droplets every minute were dispersed. And each of them is like a... It's like a sort of vehicle of hydrogen moving around this cityscape. So uh, people could create by pressing kind of certain uh, um, activation zones, they could create their own stream of, of um, tiny droplets, which would then go and interact in this kind of cityscape. Um, this video is working. And in the end, the, the 20,000 droplets, they coalesce to form a single pool of water in the center of the exhibit. But you can see this here. Um, you can hear this amazing soundtrack that was done by Wide Bird, which is a, a, a fantastic sound design company in Berlin. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, engineers, fantastic engineers, IARP from Switzerland, and 
uh, and then Hyundai themselves. So this kind of idea of collaboration with scientists, um, technicians, engineers, to create a kind of new, um, a new way of experiencing an idea, um, but without an object, the space itself was the exhibition, was the object. So that's what's kind of interesting. Um, we kind of tried to do this approach again in, um, at the UK Pavilion in Astana, which is in Kazakhstan, which, which Caroline mentioned in her introduction. And here, the, the main topic of the exhibition, uh, say that all of the countries were participating, was, was energy. And uh, when we were thinking about it, we thought all of the, uh, all of the countries will be promoting solar energy, like uh, um, wind energy, um, hydropower, all of this kind of stuff, and demonstrating their technologies in that department. And we thought we should kind of get people to understand really what energy is from the beginning. So we started with a collaboration with Brian Eno, the, the, the musician. And Brian, uh, if you haven't heard his music, it's, um, you will hear some in a moment. Brian made a sound uh, um, recording, and it starts with a, a sound of the beginning of the universe in his imagination. And it was like a single bit of, a single moment in time, like a single piece of energy, which then kind of fragments and becomes kind of uh, diverse and, and, and multi-channel as you move through the exhibition. And we, we began with the beginning of time, let's say the um, in, in kind of one theoretical physics kind of uh, perspective, um, and a collaboration with Dr. Catherine Hymans, who's a, who's a fantastic astrophysicist who deals with dark matter at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we took people on a journey from, say, from energy to matter, the creation of hydrogen helium particles to the sun so the kind of the kind of clustering of those particles and then from the sun's energy to um, to the earth and in the center of the exhibition we constructed um, a structure which was which resembled the Kazakh yurt the yurt is like a you could say like a really fundamental or archetypal piece of architecture uh, it's a it's a it's a nomadic architecture which um, allowed people to survive uh, in a really complex, tough climate for thousands of years. And uh, around this yurt, uh, we created a, a panorama which was um, entirely digital. I'll explain kind of the yurt itself responded to human birth. The idea of kind of the role of the human being in transforming their environment. you're hearing is, is Brian's Brian's soundtrack um, and this is this kind of 50 meter long panorama which is completely constructed in, in CD and rendered it was rendered entirely in the cloud it was a living panorama of like uh, several million trees landscape weather features rain um, sun had its own day and night like we created this kind of possible uh, future world in which um, like a really archetypal piece of architecture, uh, let's say one of the first structures human beings built was put at the center as, uh, as the most sophisticated piece of uh, relationship man has ever had with his climate. It's kind of this idea that we have to look backwards to look forward. Um, yeah, so you see, you see here uh, the yurt in the center of the structure and the uh, and this panorama that wrapped around it. I directed this film. Uh, this is a, it's about a 10 minute long piece of computer graphics film. It's, it's a um, 40,000 pixels wide. Um, so I moved kind of in, in kind of um, role from exhibition designer architect into a uh, film director in, in order to be able to express uh, the ideas that I had and the relationship between uh, energy and uh, human beings and where we are now and where we are in the future. And what's really interesting about this panorama, we engineered it to, uh, to look like everywhere on earth. It looks like Kazakhstan, it looks like Scotland, it looks like the USA, um, which has allowed the public to connect with it, to resonate with the ideas. But fundamentally, architecture was used as the exhibit in this, uh, in this uh, exhibition. Architecture was the exhibit just as with the Museum of London, architecture is the exhibit. There are no objects really in this exhibition. 
uh, it's just experience and architecture. And in fact, because uh, the the uh, let's say the, the commissioner of the ex the the commissioner was was so worried about that they actually brought an object at the end because they, <laughs> in order to put in the exhibition because they felt that they needed one object so they brought a light bulb uh, in order to put in there to kind of close the close the conversation but essentially architecture as exhibit okay so um, now we move to uh, um, to Africa and the exhibition uh, at the uh, uh, the Noi Samlong. And this is uh, this was a sort of opportunity to bring together a lot of the ideas, a lot of things that we'd practiced, um, but at a completely different scale. Um, and by working with, uh, we were approached by um, Dr. Angelica Nollert, um, who asked us to contribute to the exhibition and to, to, to design it. And we were joined there with a, um, around 500 uh, African ceramics, which are part of the collection of Dr. Franz, uh, Duke of Bavaria. And um, alongside uh, Dr. Nollert, we had uh, Caroline Fuchs, uh, who was uh, um, our uh, the curator also working with us on the, on the exhibition. Um, we were the exhibition designer in our role. Um, and also jo Dr. Joseph uh, Stallard. So we had, a, we had a, a fantastic group of people alongside uh, Dr. Barbara Thompson as well, who was the curator of African ceramics, been working with um, uh, Duke Franz for many years on this collection. Um, so what could our approach be? Um, we wanted to be respectful to the collection and respectful to the origins of each of these wonderful, wonderful objects. And it was the first time that they would be exhibited in a design museum. It's probably the first time an exhibition of African ceramics um, with this broadness of, um, of um, heritage, uh, provenance, and, and, uh, and kind of time scale has been shown in a design museum, or given the respect to be shown as, as works of art and design outside of like an ethnographic context. And this is like really a profound, a profound statement, I think, for the museum to make. Um, so we understood um, that it's, uh, it's a complex idea um, and in a kind of post-colonial context, it's, uh, it's something which is loaded with, with, uh, with meaning and, and can be loaded with controversy. So we wanted to sort of make sure that the objects were treated with respect and that we, we, um, we included, uh, let's say, a number of... We included our approach of, um, of, of collaboration and an exhibition design and architecture all coming together in order to turn the experience of these objects into something that was... Um, really comprehensible and understandable in a way that it hadn't been done before. So um, this image showed um, the original archive in Dr. Franz's, uh, um, um, Dr. Franz's, uh, sorry, in uh, Duke Franz's ha uh, house, the archive of all of the objects. Um, and so there were 250 objects selected from the total of these, around four themes, form, technique, materiality, gender, and body. Um, ceramics and markets and, and, and contemporary. And so you had an enormous range and a, and a, and a, and a great number of uh, countries um, whose uh, ceramicists were participating in this. So um, I think the work represents over 100 years of, of, of history of um, objects which are used for a mixture from daily life to objects which had ritual use and, um, um, and kind of ceremonial use. Um, so highly functional objects, which um, which were um, vessels containing um, um, food and water and uh, and beer, even the exhibition was over two spaces. And I hope some of you listening ha uh, had the opportunity to visit the exhibition. This is the spaces as we found them at the beginning. This is the upper space, uh, the rotunda in in a uh, in the museum. It's a naturally lit gallery uh, on the third floor of the museum. So this is the kind of first really powerful space uh, that we were, we were given. The second space was uh, an artificially lit gallery on the second floor. So we had these on the ground floor. Sorry. So we had these kind of two very different spaces um, to, um, uh, to play with, really. Uh, now, Barbara Thompson had been working with Duke Franz for over 20 years, and, and through her guidance, we start to imagine how a collection could be exhibited. Um, through a process of discussion and debate, we agreed that there could be two kind of distinctive experiences in those two spaces. So whilst in the rotunda, 
we thought we could exhibit the ceramics as though they were objects within the within the archive. Um, and uh, the second was thinking about frozen movement, like how we could capture the way those objects were used in daily life. And you know, like a a, um, a piece of ceramic has weight and it has texture. It has it's affected by gravity, particularly when it has water in it or another liquid. So often in museums, we see them abstracted and put on a plinth. We never really understand what it feels like to use them. And um, unfortunately, we can't give we couldn't give every visitor the chance to pick these uh, to pick these up because they're very precious, fragile objects. Um, but we wanted to give that feeling, so we started to think about how we could bring the human body into the exhibition and make it understandable for people. Um, we were also thinking about how the objects were stored um, and how they were used and how they were made. So in the second ground, the ground floor gallery, we wanted to remind people that these were made from clay uh, and the clay had come from the earth. And it just hadn't come from any earth. It had come from a particular place and a particular time. And those places still exist. So this was, um, let's say, completing full circle. If you think about design, we always, we always um, uh, in a design exhibition, we're thinking about the resource, we're thinking about uh, the aesthetics and we're thinking about the functionality of something, we're thinking about how it's used. And we wanted to cover all of these bases. Um, and through all of those, the visitor can understand the meaning. Um, at the same time, um, we were developing an idea for um, how these ceramics could be displayed. Um, now, my mother is actually from Tanzania. So uh, I grew up being surrounded by a lot of Makonde pieces. And these are these are wooden Makonde pieces, isn't it? Uh, you might have thought this was Picasso or, or Brancusi, but it's actually, uh, these are Makonde artisans, um, Makonde artists um, from Tanzania and Kenya. That whole region is where this art form uh, began and was you know, copied globally. So we were thinking that um, since Makonde art has such a kind of powerful abstraction of the human body, maybe we could work with Makonde artists to create the mounts for the exhibition. So they could depict the human body in the form of in their art form, and we could use these depictions uh, as sculpture to, to hold the pieces in the, in the exhibition. And uh, the gentleman on the right here is, is Ntoluma, uh, who is a, is a great Makonde artist from Tanzania. Um, you also see, that's, that's me, uh, you, you know, me already, and you see Madalena uh, Adondo, who's, a, who's one of the, the greatest contemporary ceramicists uh, in the world. Like you'll, you'll see her, you'd have seen her work in the exhibition if you had the opportunity to go. And, and there's some members of my studio who, who also uh, um, designed and ran this exhibition. They kind of saw it through from, from, from beginning to end. So you have there uh, Dan Sweeting, Peter Vaughan, uh, uh, you, uh, you have um, Alex and Yola, and so it was a fantastic group effort from 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 all of these people. Uh, we mapped the the individual um, uh, pots, and ten there were ten um, ten pieces that Dr. Thompson selected, which were which best illustrated different uses of the pots, from storage to drinking vessels, meth, drinking vessels. And Untaluma took careful measurements of each piece on a template, and he thought about as an artist, how he would mount them, how he would uh, depict their use um, um, as an artist. Um, and we ended up with a very, very uh, wonderful, um, expressive, and quite challenging, I think, curatorially, quite challenging aesthetically, um, 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 collaboration between the past and the present. An artist from the past, an artist from the present. Like, like our Museum of London project is a collaboration between uh, the architect from the past and us, the architect of the present. And all of these these um, uh, um, discussions over time, I find I find very interesting. Um, in Taluma, used a, a timber called iron wood, and it was so hard that he had to use sometimes an angle grinder to to carve the pieces into an exact fit. Um, so it's a kind of a mixture of contemporary and traditional techniques. It, um, it was an extremely challenging process for the artist and the curators and the technicians. Uh, from Danui Samlan to, to accomplish. And so this was a really a, a, a kind of fantastic collaboration um, and challenging collaboration. It forced people to come together and cross bridges and to think about uh, 
the new meaning of things, like the weather, what it meant to to put these beautiful, um, um, uh, spiritually very p- potent figurines in a in a, a Makonde carved piece. What it meant for for us to look at it, and what it meant for those to be exhibited. Um, and often we feel um, when we're dealing with precious objects that we have to put them on a plinth and remove uh, remove ourselves from the conversation because we're somehow contaminating the purity of them. But what what um, what we thought was very interesting, especially in the context of a design museum, is to enable a collaboration to happen and enable something new and breathtaking uh, to come out of it. And I think this is a, a fantastic example of that. Um, and within the rest of the exhibition, the remaining objects were, were, were arranged in this abstract form of archive or storage. And it was, the idea was to, to illustrate how they were stored in, uh, by, the, by Duke Franz as he kind of um, collected them over the years um, and how we first encountered them when we, when we first saw them in his store, which is above his house. He kept them very close to him because he, he wanted to look at them every day. Um, and the exhibition layout worked with the existing structure of the building and this kind of archive shelving. But it also allowed people to experience, the, experience these beautiful objects from every color with very uniform lighting and truly appreciate the level of craft, uh, texture, color, and decoration, and somehow see them as a flat, flat plane. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of the indexical approach, whereas in the uh, ground floor, we took a very different approach. So the second space, again, we wanted to create another collaboration. We wanted to talk about landscape and where um, and how we could create an immersive um, exhibition experience, which helped people understand the subject matter. So most of these pots we learned were made by female artisans, female artists. So that's women working with the land, taking clay from a place like this uh, to to a workshop to their homes, sculpting the clay, firing it, and turning it, take, and then it going to a market. So we worked with a South African uh, art photographer and videographer, Andy Mkoni, and she we, we commissioned her through Design in Daba in Cape Town, which is a great design organization and design conference. We commissioned her through the New Samlang to to go to KwaZulu Natal and film the place where some of these pots originated, so where the clay came from. And so she produced a a kind of a landscape still life, uh, which is a kind of video which plays, uh, which plays on a, um, uh, on a kind of loop. I don't know, several minutes. I don't know whether you can see this, but there's a, um, there's a, uh, um, yes, you see in the background there, it provides a context, a context for the, um, for the exhibition design, a context for the uh, for each of these ceramics to connect with the land. So whereas in the upstairs exhibition, we connected with the human body, here we connect with the land and with the clay where they're, that they're made from. And the reason to do this is about storytelling. We just wanted the story to be complete. By the projection of the of the wall of the gallery and the sound of the wind in the trees and the sound of the rainfall and the movement of the river, the backdrop brings these objects to life. And this serpentine display that we made, like this kind of uh, um, curving path, it's meant, to, it's meant to, um, um, to be a reflection of the river. It's not only allowing the objects to be viewed, viewed as a unified collection when we first enter the space, but it also reminds us, and the clay color that we've used, it reminds us that the ceramics are from the earth, they're from the ground. Now, what was very, very, wonderful and I think uh, enormously challenging and a great accomplishment for the technicians and the curators here in the show is that they agreed to um, have all the works exhibited um, in the room without glass. I don't think this is, maybe it's never been done before. It was done with great care and great respect to the, with, to the objects, but also with great respect um, to the public. And the idea being that we wanted the public to almost be able to smell the life in these objects, that they don't, they are removed, they're not removed from reality and put in this distant space. They're, they're experienced in an intimate way, uh, in a way that, um, that someone who is, um, uh, who is dealing with these and living with these objects in their daily life might have the opportunity to, 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 have, to experience them. Through a sort of subtle interplay of, of sound, movement and material, alongside what I think was a great collaboration between curators 
um, lifelong researchers and artists, um, the exhibition, you know, seek to accomplish, uh, I think, a, a, a convergence uh, and, a, and, a, and a new expression of, uh, of the art form. Uh, and I think that's, that's what we can do. You know, Dr. Nola said to us that, um, you, what does it mean, a, a new perspective? It's a different way of viewing things. And it's precisely not a traditional way of viewing something different. Difference and diversity is a maxim and the ideal of a museum. And that's what we consider our greatest task. So I don't think, um, uh, I don't think we've had such a, a, an amazing collaboration um, in an exhibition design context uh, in, in any of our projects. It was a kind of, it was the most um, fantastic combining of intellects and, and, and art forms. And as I said, like research and, and, um, and experience. And the whole idea was to give the public a new perspective. Um, so just a final, a final point, you know, moving from that age of Instagram, which we're in at the moment, which is, uh, I'd say chaos and I, I believe crisis, absolute crisis. Uh, we need to remember, um, that by, um, working together and by supporting each other as, as exhibition designers, architects, curators, and researchers, we can tell the story of humanity, um, in a new way and we can learn for it. Uh, and gain inspiration uh, for the future. And that inspiration is critical uh, to our future. Thank you. So, um, thank, you. thank you so much, Asif. This was a very, very inspiring talk. Um, many, many ideas. Um, there are some um, questions from the public. Um, I also would like to start with one of my own because I, when you mentioned you started with Crystal Palace or it's most not at the beginning, not the start. And when I now see you and then you showed your other project and made me see them in a different way, I think what I think is that all your or many of your structures are about perspective actually or about looking through. So Crystal Palace was, was a building that wouldn't, case people in because you could look outside it gave you a vista and the portals very much give you different views and vistas and and the pavilion the Hyundai pavilion made you look at the sky and you look at small scale and, and I'm not I don't know if you agree but <laughs> I think this is something that's very crucial for your work isn't it or or am I wrong entirely <laughs> so interesting someone uh I think you are, um, I mean, you're the curator, so you can find these, you can find these things and, and, uh, and you're right. I think, uh, when I did the, the portals project at Dubai Expo, which is, you know, it's, unfortunately it's not open to the public yet. And if you go to Dubai in, in next October, you will see the, the 2020 Expo is in 2021 because of COVID, but you'll see it there. Mm -hmm. And, um, someone has said to me, a close friend who's also a curator has said to me, Uh, now I understand what you do. You, all your work is about matrabias uh, or screens. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and I hadn't really thought about this before, but, um, and I thought, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe it is. I think it's, for me, it's about this, uh, this pursuit of the infinite and trying to, uh, whether it's at a miniature scale or at this kind of grand scale, um, create experiences which which uh, transcend uh, our our perception and our our kind of existing reality. I think it puts people in a state of mind um, that allows them to to um, to absorb uh, new ideas and to create to be in a kind of uh, in it to imagine new things to create new things themselves. So I'm very interested in doing something that can empower people. Uh, um, through changing their consciousness. So I think you're, you're very right, Caroline. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's definitely a, repeat, a repeating uh, concept for sure. And it's also about integration. Isn't it? I mean, you, you, if, you, if you have a vista, you, you integrate the outside. And, and there's, there's one question, especially um, to this point, um, 
one in the audience, there was a question, um, I, I read it out to you. One of the things that I personally appreciate about your work is your commitment to integration, different countries in one project. Who, what shaped your views on this topic? Oh, that's a great, great question. Thank, thank you for, 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 for seeing that. Um, I think, you know, I, I grew up uh, in, a, in a household where the, the common language was English. Even though my father is from uh, Pakistan, my mother is, um, she's Indian, but from East Africa. Many, many languages, Swahili, uh, Urdu, Kachi, Gujarati, um, and English was, a, and Punjabi, and the English was a common language between us. And in my family, uh, I have a, um, uh, you know, an aunt who's from Holland, uh, and, and uh, um, my kids are half Japanese, and, uh, um, you know, uh, my, my girlfriend is from Kazakhstan and my office are the most diverse, um, uh, studio I think you, you could find. And I think, uh, what I believe is that, uh, by learning from each other, um, we, we don't just absorb information. We challenge our own perspectives of things and, and our, our own, um, uh, we grow. And I, I love to put myself in a scenario where, um, where I know nothing and actually I'm learning from people around me. And I found the greatest learnings are from people who are the most different from us. Um, so, you know, we didn't know what the result would be of working with Interluma. And, uh, uh, and he was working, I mean, it was fantastic. He was going back, uh, you know, between uh, Tanzania and uh, Kenya. And, and then I think he, he, then he did the work at both in both Lisbon and in we had he, he's living and he had some commissions and also in Germany, he worked then with the uh, uh, fantastic technical staff in 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 the uh, in the museum, um, and there's something about um, the pleasure, the pleasure in seeing uh, things unfold. That uh, even though you know, like one of the bad things about architects is we can be control freaks, right? We can really micromanage. We, we, we want to know everything and control everything. But I got, I started to realize that there's more beauty in the things that we can't control and that we discover through these collaborations. And we learn, as I said, we learn so much through them. And, uh, I've been really, uh, really enjoying, uh, to never stop being a student, uh, to keep this, to keep this, yeah, uh, um, kind of approach to life. Of course, I have yes. students as well, you know. But but but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think I think uh, yeah, we all have to keep searching, um, and this is a way we we grow. Yeah, yeah. It's also about being open to to receiving a lesson, even though you're not a student, isn't it? So yeah, you know, learning yeah. from from something, even though you're not in the position to learn, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes I, I find that. Um, particularly in like professional life and uh, when you're doing public projects and uh, which we're, which we're doing, um, everything gets like, ev everyone takes the approach of, uh, they, they kind of confuse um, uh, as though risk and creativity are in opposites of each other. And uh, they feel that um, everything needs to be predictable and the answers need to be given at the beginning and you can't leave anything to discover uh, or to create uh, new processes. So, so I think uh, what we're trying to do in our very large projects is to, is to always bring in um, a bit of real life back into them to stop it becoming like a kind of project management driven <laughs> hell, <laughs> but, but, but to let, uh, but to let, um, serendipity and chance and, uh, uh, um, uh, and creativity and imagination to become part of it. And, and what you find is when you do that, um, of course, things happen people didn't imagine, but also the clients and the project managers, um, they realize that we're all human after all and that we need those things. Uh, and they're very happy at the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, it is, it is, it is entirely possible. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll give you an example from the, from the expo project. Uh, we were asked, of course, because we're in charge of this public realm, we, we, um, 
there was a collaboration with a, a, an engineer um, who was uh, making the canopies, these kind of shading canopies around the whole Olymp the whole park, right, in the Expo Park in in Dubai, and which are which are fantastic, really technically brilliant things, um, and they retract and and whatever, and 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 um, uh, they asked me, uh, asked uh, what color should they be, the steel work? What color should the steel work be? And I said, you know, I, I really don't know, um, but I met this artist. Uh, who's the, uh, let's say, like preeminent contemporary artist of the UAE, or like, let's say he was the first contemporary artist, a guy called uh, Abdul Qadir al Reis. He's a watercolorist. Maybe he's in his 60s. I said, I don't know the answer to what they should look like, but why don't we ask um, uh, Abdul Qadir what color they should be? And, and, you know, of course, that's really scary because uh, he could have come up with any answer, right? And I was having a discussion with him, um, like, Perhaps say the color of the trees, the, the trees that you find in the desert, like the, the gaff tree, the, the, the tree that is the, um, the hero of the desert. You know, it, it, fe it feeds people when they're hungry. It's kind of it survives. It's an amazing, amazing thing. The roots are 50 meters deep. And I said, uh, Abdul Qadir, why don't you show us your, um, your watercolor in interpretation of what a gaff tree uh, looks like? I need two colors for you, from you. Uh, from a column and a beam. And he came up with this color, which they then matched with, they made this special industrial paint called gaff tree green. And, gaff, and, and everyone said, oh no, it's green, but it should be gray. It should be, you know. But it, once they painted it, it was the most beautiful thing. And, it, you know, the idea that the, like 500 steel columns in a, in a, in, across six kilometers of public realm can be uh, uh, can be from the paintbrush of a of a watercolorist. Like uh, you wouldn't imagine to bring those two things together, and and the outcome uh, you wouldn't imagine it would be beautiful, but it worked. Um, and even the story is amazing. Like I have photos of him going and pondering which tree should we take the color from. Um, and I think that's important to bring uh, to bring meaning into into daily life and to bring meaning to things that that people forget need meaning. Uh, and I think that's part of when we speak about exhibition design and how the architecture is the exhibition design. Like that's what, in a way, that's what I mean. Everything is embedded with the the manifesto. Everything should be embedded with the concept in these in these spaces. Um, and uh, yeah, and at the at the end of that, it's just such a. It's also such a pleasure to to have those experiences in your life. You know, where you get to meet these people and uh, and learn something from them. Yeah, yeah he gave me, it, uh, reminds me, it reminds yeah. me of the, of the hands, you know, in the exhibition. Um, that was something, you know, without you, we would never have dreamed of doing something like that. <laughs> and and yeah. it was such a good experience. And it, it, I mean, it, as you said, it was a very good collaboration, but it, I think it worked because our technical team and the con con conservation team They all saw the idea, you know, I, I went to them and I said, no, sit down, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'll have something, I have sent a proposal and, but, you know, don't freak out at once. And they were all like, no, I like it. I really like it. Let's try to make this happen. You know, it was, um, and that's why it worked. And that's how it worked. I think everybody saw the the idea or the, the, the good challenge in it, you know, the positive challenge in it. And, and it was good to be challenged. And it, it's very good yes. to be challenged. <laughs> and, 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 you know, from a technical perspective, but also from a perspective of, um, of, um, of curation and like, um, like symbolic meaning and whether you can intervene, like whether you can, connect things together that weren't connected together. Like we always, it's that idea of like um, uh, the fourth wall, you know, breaking down the fourth wall in theater. Like when the, the actor is, is a, it's suddenly in the audience space and it's like a very, it's a kind of moment of um, where you're not sure which version of the thing is, uh, uh, is real. Like, and actually this tension between um, like, contemporary discourse, which anyway is always changing and people are coming with new ideas and the past and, and, and uh, it has to be there actually.
for the work to have to have uh, to stay alive. I I I, I believe. Um, yeah. And uh, maybe, maybe we don't get it right. And but I think through the kind of, you know, you don't always. Um, you can't say you'll always get it right, but I think we try to um, have like have the. Um, um, uh, you don't have the fear to engage in that conversation. I think that's that's what's really important. And you know, and I think also um, I'm very proud of uh, the fact that that project is um, such a great example of inclusivity and diversity in in all respects. Um, um, particularly as like this has become a in the in the kind of creative um, um, in the world of museums, particularly uh, and our cities. It's been a great question. How are we including people? How are we allowing more diverse voices to be part of the conversation? And how do we tell stories of our history? Um, you know, we had people pulling down statues uh, all over the world. Um, and uh, it's really important for that to happen. But, you know, before that, in our exhibition with you, we were exploring inclusion and exploring diversity and, and, uh, and trying to produce and commissioning new artists uh, uh, um, in South Africa, and you know, and and um, uh, through Maconde and, and contemporary film, and we, we we did that because of the open-minded approach uh, that that you had at the museum, and I, um, so you know, I really apl applaud that, um, and we did it not because of uh, needing people to think we were great, we did it because it was, <laughs> we thought it would create the most interesting and creative outcome for the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's very true. Yeah, um, I'm always thinking okay. about other people le uh, uh, copy us a bit. You know, there's there's so much more people can do with this uh, approach. Yes, that's true. Yeah, maybe maybe one more question. I'm not sure. I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. But um, there's one question about your exhibition design um, and the way. Um, yeah, I'll just read it. You have shown very convincingly how architecture can become an exhibit in the Hyundai building. In which way has your exhibition architecture been itself an exhibit in the Munich ceramics exhibition? Isn't it more difficult as soon as there are other exhibits evol evolved? So I think this is about, you know. Yeah. So, so um, for me in that, in that um, um, you have to, I guess, think of architecture as a scalable thing, and the role of the architect is a, is a sort of um, our job is to um, like provide the uh, the rhythm, and if we provide the rhythm, then the other musicians, in a way, can plug into it and follow that rhythm, and and the objects are like that. The objects are are the individual stories, and what we've created there is um, these two distinct spaces, let's say an archive and, a, um, uh, and this river, this flow of a river with different color, different type of lighting conditions, different way the objects are seen, uh, which puts you in quite a, di quite a different frame of mind. And then we've dealt with these two topics, the body, and it's a kind of micro architecture scale, which is, you know, the relationship between the hand and the object. Um, and trying to get beyond the plinth, the traditional plinth, which is, I think, can be a curse sometimes of, of, uh, of exhibition and, and object display. Uh, and then in the other space as well, it's, it's not a plinth, it's a continuous surface um, and allows all objects to be dis to displayed in a, in a continuum. But also it links to the idea of uh, landscape and, uh, and the origins of clay and water. Um, so I think I think that's the that's the architecture in in those in those exhibits, and I think you could um, you know when we when this show was empty before the objects were put there, and this river was moving through the space, and we had just the video on the wall. Um, it also worked. It had meaning. It had potency. You were like, wow, uh, this is a this is an amazing experience of a river in in in, in South Africa. Uh, and of course, when you add the add the objects, it it gets even deeper, and you start to make new connections. Um, but uh, but often a room of empty plinths is nothing. Uh, so this was a very yeah, this is a very beautiful and surprising uh, thing. But I think that's that's really what the architecture is. 
and in the end it's a it's a if it's if it works it's a it's like a good conversation between the objects between the architecture between the exhibition design yeah so they all exactly. add their voices yeah and and also um, the human bodies in the exhibition uh, you're always seeing um, many people against the uh, the ceramics you see people behind and in front and so they 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 become like part of a human human scenery mm-hmm. which is i think it's it's kind of the world they belong in they don't they are precious but it's it's such a great um opportunity to show them in outside of the glass case and 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 uh, in the human context yes no that's very important i think yeah not disting not trying to distance them as much as possible <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah all right so thank you very very much asif um I'm afraid our time is more than up. <laughs> But thank you very very much. Uh, it was fantastic talk, very inspiring and um fantastic to see you at least on the screen and um I hope um, we can do this again sometime in person <laughs> and um yeah, all the best to your studio. Thank them again for the fantastic work and I hope everybody is well. And well we yeah, we so um, thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in such a great exhibition, and thank you to the audience uh, for your patience and taking the time to join us tonight and uh, to uh, to ask the questions and, and participate. So thanks so much for that. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Okay, okay before we go offline, um, just a few announcements. Um, if if you're interested in other programs, we started an Instagram um, series um, during the COVID season with short guided tours. Maybe you want to look into that. And um, there are actually three exhibitions opening until December at the museum. And the museum is open, so we hope to see you online. We hope to see you in the museum. Uh, well. All right, so another huge thanks to you, Asif, to the studio, to everybody who made this talk possible and wishing you all health and safety and um, thank you for joining us. Um, Good night. Stay safe.